Hey everybody, my name is Kyla. Welcome to my channel where we talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. Today I have an interview with Alex from Open Access and what Open Access is doing is working around data storytelling and data transparency. What Open Access is enabling is if you see a chart in a news article or a Substack piece or on Twitter.com, ideally you'd be able to see the source of that data and you'd be able to go see what exactly is going on. There's a lot of data misinformation out there. There's a lot of people that use data, maybe in ways that data shouldn't be used. And what Open Access wants to do is create collaboration around data and create a way for us all to tell stories with all the information that we have floating around, which is a lot. So if you like it, go check out openaccess.com. They're doing a lot of really interesting things right now. And we'll go ahead and get into the interview. Hey, Alex. Thanks so much for joining me to talk about your work today. How's it going, Kyla? I really wanted to talk about what you all are doing with data and how you're creating a lot of open access, open access for data. So could you talk a little bit bit about, you know, what you think the state of data is today and why you all made open access the way that you did? Yeah, great question. Um, so high level open access is a platform to simplify and democratize data storytelling. We want to make it easy to find data, visualize it and collaborate with others to tell stories. And the state of data is a great question. So I would say it's not great. The, the zeitgeist is no shared base and facts and poor data literacy. Despite having probably most data ever created in the history of, of humanity, we have a lot of people who don't know how to access it or even visualize it. Some tools out there are kind of technical and difficult for people to, to use. Despite the fact that we actually, you know, we all want to understand data, right? We want to understand ourselves. We want to understand the world, whether you're, you know, you're reading the news or whether you're at work, you know, when you have some KPIs or whether you're looking at your Fitbit to see how you're doing, you know, data is kind of fundamental to truth and progress, but we made it kind of hard for people to use it. So there's potential there, but we need to, like I said, simplify it so people can understand it. They can, they can use it in their decision-making. Whereas right now, culturally that doesn't seem to be there. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, your background and what got you so interested in democratizing data? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean the reason why I founded a, a startup with my my friends is um the 2020 elections. So my last gig was as the the policy director for Andrew Yang's 2020 presidential campaign, you know, the math guy with the hat. We were very data driven and that experience made me realize a few things that led us to to where we are before. And before that I was a political economist, I was at the United Nations, I was in Africa and the Middle East for five years. I ran my own macro geopolitical research firm. So data has been fundamental to understanding the world for me and my work. And I realized that, you know, it should be for everybody. But what happened with the with the election was a few things. First of all, within the campaign, let's call it like a little company, right? You, you raise a lot of money, you have a lot of departments. We realized that the non-technical departments struggle to use data for their work, like, you know, communications, marketing, um, even voter outreach to the point where the data team became a bottleneck for them. So that was one issue like, okay, kind of have a last mile problem within, within organizations where non-technical people need data to tell stories. The second thing was, it was actually kind of hard to collaborate with others, your campaign, right? And a lot of academics and think tanks sent you a lot of really cool reports and data sets, but it's very messy. You know, you get version four or five on Excel, you get one academic send you something else, and then one consultant to the point where we actually almost made a mistake because we, we were had very messy data sets. So it's hard to collaborate and existing tools are kind of technical and complicated. And the third thing that happened, which I think is actually the coolest, is the Yang Gang, our, our ardent supporters, would actually take the data from our policies, like universal basic income, and they would go on the subreddit and create their own charts. So they're actually de facto creating a community where they can collaborate with each other to crowdsource insights and, and solve problems. So I thought, okay, cool. Like, you know, people want to have a place where they can tell stories of data, where they can collaborate, they can solve problems, but existing tools are hard and no place really exists. That's kind of why we ended up doing open access. You know, how do you simplify the process? How do you give people the tools to, you know, come up with something? Because then, you know, COVID-19 happened, right? And one of the very few positive byproducts of it, if there are any, it was probably the only time again in history where you had so many eyeballs looking at the same data at the same time. And what happened? Like random people came up with really cool insights, like Thomas Pueyo's Hammer in the Dance article. You should all check it out. Okay, if you give people the tools in a place, they'll do it and they'll collaborate and they'll solve problems. So that's kind of why we want to come up to it and, and sort of uh, solve this problem now. On your website, you say data is a driver of progress and a foundation of truth. And I think that's really true, like from what you're saying about COVID and just from having more eyeballs on the data sets. I mean, you see it with government data and econ all the time. Like it's just really confusing about what's going on. So the more people that you have working on it, the, the better probably. And you all have made that easy, right? Like a way for many people to collaborate. They just upload a data set. How does that process work with in interacting with the website? Yeah, absolutely. We, we've evolved a lot since we started. At first, it was just a really mm -hmm. simple data visualization tool. But we realized that as you're kind of alluding to, like data storytelling is a long process. You know, you find the data, you clean it, you 
visualize it, you try to find a way to collaborate with it. So we wanted to put that all into one in one place because, you know, writers or journalists who were using us were saying, hey, like, I actually don't know where to find the data. Like, do you have data for me? Like, do I have to upload it myself? So that was one problem we wanted to solve. And then the second one is, okay, how simple is this tool? You know, is it point and click? Is it no code? Like, I barely use pivot tables. And the third thing is like, actually, can I just like browse and see what other people have come up with? I would love to build upon this person's work that I think is amazing. So with all that in mind, we try to solve all that. So right now, yes, you can go to our platform. You can search for data sets, you know, with keywords, or you can upload your own, like a CSV or a link. Once you upload it, we try to read it for you. We're like a, we panel it. So we're like, all right, this is a string. This is a, a number. This is a date. So we make sure that you're reading it properly and we're reading it properly. So when we do go to the chart creator, you can actually create a chart that you like. You can filter it. So you can play around with it. And then when you when you post it or when you publish it, there's always a back link. So if you want to share it externally, like a sub stack, you know, your readers can actually click into it. They can dig in, they can download the data set, they can comment, like they can create their own chart on top of it. So then you'll reach a point where let's say either I or somebody else uploaded a data set on wealth in a certain country. You can see how many people create charts on top of that. And it's a really cool way, like I said before, to crowdsource insights. So we're trying to make all those parts of the points of the data storytelling chain very accessible and easy at the moment. And we kind of end up curating, right? Curating content and people end up using us almost as a distribution channel for their data sets and, and charts, which I think is, is really cool. Like not only again, are we promoting transparency, but we're inviting people to collaborate, which I think is kind of exciting to see what people come up with. I had been on the census website, like trying to parse through data, people with no mortgage and a mortgage. And I downloaded the CSV file and I was like, I don't know the best way to visualize this. And I think like even just those use cases of getting government data, getting data from Fred, whatever, but then also being able to collaborate and see how other people are building with that data set is just super, super valuable. So like, what is the current state of the company? Like, what are your current goals right now? Where are you all at and what are you sort of working on? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're in beta. As I said before, we've kind of evolved for just a data viz tool to a data storytelling platform. We have about 20,000 monthly active users who are coming up, whether they're, you know, creating charts or uploading data sets, or they're just like browsing. And we just released a new version of our chart creator, which I think is awesome. It's really easier and, and more beautiful templates. So we're very excited about that. A lot of our early users, what you would call like the go to market strategy have been writers and journalists mm -hmm. because they want a simple tool and they want to pump out content for their brand. But we're also seeing interest from enterprises and media companies, which is kind of like our long-term plan uh, to eventually get into the enterprise. But right now we're just an open source data storytelling platform. A lot of writers are using us, a lot of journalists. We might start doing some competitions with one uh, major political party that wants to use us to kind of ask their supporters to say, hey, like, what data sets and charts can you come up with that either support our policy planks or maybe even challenge them? Like, we want to see what you come up with. So that's also kind of exciting as well. So um, it's going to be exciting a uh, quarter right now. The beta is accessible to anybody who wants uh, to sign up for it. Yeah. And I'll have that link um, in the show notes in the description box if you want to sign up. But I feel like the word democratization kind of gets thrown around a lot. But to what you're doing with political parties specifically, not only are you showing people like here's the data that either supports the policy or whatever, but here's actually how you can engage with it. And I feel like that's like a deeper level of engaging with the political sphere than people are used to. What is the ideal outcome with that? Is just people having more knowledge or is that the main goal? Yeah, great question. I would say twofold. One is yes, so more knowledge. And it's honestly, Kyle, it's going to take a, a cultural mindset shift for people to like be sure. comfortable with data, to use it yeah. for their decision making. Because right now, and something that I got kind of disillusioned with in, in, in the campaign was nobody really cares that much about policy or data. They kind of make a decision very quickly on a candidate based on certain values or certain emotions, and then they kind of go with it. And then facts at that point don't change their mind because they're part of a community. We want to be able to chip away at that. We'll be like, hey, like here's a data set. It's, it's always available, whether it's in media, whether it's in politics, whatever it is, kind of a uh, condition people to say, hey, the data set's available, the chart's available, we'll look at it, look at it. And that can at least allow people to incorporate that in their decision-making process. But then secondly, just to collaborate and, and actually work together to solve problems. I think more eyeballs and more tools allows us to come together and, and solve problems on, on various issues that, you know, require data. Uh, those are kind of the two high level goals. It's going to be a long, a long journey to get there. But, you know, with second order effects of data transparency, fight misinformation, I think that's going to be pretty exciting. Yeah. And I think it's also super powerful that you're incorporating storytelling. Like that's the main goal, right? Because that's what humans crave is, is stories. And if you're able to attach narratives to the data that people are looking at, I feel like it doesn't become as scary because you're kind of like, oh, here's some context for what all of this means. What's been like the biggest use case or like the biggest data set that people have played around 
of it so far. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're right. I mean, we all kind of like function in narrative. So anything yeah. that, and data by itself is not, is not enough. You still have to put in the chart and you still have mm-hmm. to kind of tell that story. The biggest data sets, people love economic data, Fred data in particular. I think there was a data set on wealth that, that Lucas Chancel uh, uploaded from, I forget what organization he's from. And people were really interested in seeing wealth and, and at a very granular level, whether it was demographic or it was regionally. And there were like a bunch of data sets being created on top of that, which I thought was quite cool. But we also had some COVID data uh, earlier when we started. So right now it's mostly economic. Now with the midterms coming up, uh, there's a bit more political stuff. So we have to kind of see which way we want to go, right? Eventually we want to be the home of data, but we have to start somewhere. So it usually is with economic data, it's openly accessible. And we'll probably go to political and then we'll see how the sort of the community grows from that. Yeah. I mean, to your point before, like just give people tools, give them, make it transparent because a lot of people kind of um, underestimate the average user they, that's not technical. It's like, well, Tableau is already very easy. If you can't use mm-hmm. Tableau, then you probably shouldn't be telling stories. And that was something that we came across with some you know, data scientists that we would talk to in, in terms of their teams or even investors. So that's also kind of a, something we have to push through. I mean, I always look at the Canva analogy. You know, Canva is a, a design tool for non-designers. Yeah. Photoshop is for the pros, Canva is for everybody else. So if R or Tableau or any technical tools for the pros, we want to kind of be for everybody else. Yeah, I know Canva is amazing, like what they've done and how they've sort of surpassed what you just said, where people do underestimate the average person and they're like, oh no, you could never do this. But it's just that people haven't been given the tools or the opportunity to explore that. So I think that's really powerful that you're you're doing that. With midterms, how do you see it being a use case? Like, is it really just exploring these different policies that politicians are proposing? Yeah, you- so that would be ideal. I mean, right now there's a lot of survey out there and we don't have to compete with big survey companies or Pew or, or Gallup like that's already there but surveys are usually asking about a specific topic and that topic could be like you know like do you have a high standard of living or can you afford this then we can go into that topic and then get data on that so they can have more of a robust discussion on that so that's kind of where we want to we're going to go but yeah first things first just make it accessible make the data set accessible make whatever chart is accessible and then secondly give them a space where they can where they can chat because now when people have these discussions online Twitter or anywhere else. Maybe there's an image, maybe there's a, a PNG or a screenshot, and then people are just commenting. But with us, we want to say, okay, like there's an image, but there's also a backlink that gives you access to a data set and gives you access to tools. You know, what is what does that look like? You know, what does a remixing of data and charts look mm-hmm. like the same way you remix a video or something else on, on Instagram? That we're targeting the the fundamental issues that people care about after after the surveys. And then secondly, giving them tools to see you know what they come up with. Because now it's it's tough, you know, there's echo chambers and people just kind of want to push whatever is positive or negative or whatever their pre-existing belief is, it takes time. And the best way you can do that is radical transparency with data sets, charts, and, and tools. And I think to the earlier point too of misinformation, like transparency is going to be one of the key ways to fight that. But I also have found, and I'm curious like if this is some, a thematic that you all have explored around nuance, like people just don't incorporate a lot of nuance into how they look at things. Is that something that you're actively considering as you build out open access? How do you battle people seeing things in black and white and incorporating more gray into that analysis. Is that something that you've worked on? Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, it's definitely as part of our plan. So right now it's a very simple tool. So it's obviously hard to, to be super granular and, or nuanced about what analysis you're making. But the best thing we can do is, so people aren't too black and white is like I said before, radical transparency. You see everything, people can collaborate with you. Over time, we'll have probably some AI where you can kind of read a data set and be like, hey, like we could do this or you should try that. But right now, it's it's just giving people the openness to to look at things and be like, hey, I think about this, I think about that. But that's that's already good enough. Like we're kind of raising the floor of the discussion. It doesn't matter. We can always make arguments on data sets. I can look at a data set. You can say something. I can say something else. During the campaign, again, we wrote a New York Times op-ed about basically our platform, you know, universal basic income and the reason why automation was having an impact and, and those things. And Paul Krugman, the famed economist, just trashed it. He's like, no, this is garbage, blah, 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 blah. Well, he brought his data and we brought our data and we had a a decent discussion and that's okay like we can have disagreements but at least we're looking at data sets that we can confirm or verify so like level one or phase one is like are we looking at data can we agree on that phase two is okay let's have a discussion around it and uh and give people those tools to to say okay this is you know this is a trend and in the time series plot like that you could be interested in or this is you know something else and we can get there over time but the, mm-hmm. the goal now is kind of like raise that floor I'm, I'm curious about like the end goal, right? So you said it's sort of going enterprise, but how do you reconcile the 
the you know transparency democratization of data with that sort of end enterprise goal is there going to be retail as well as enterprise offering yeah yeah good point so the idea is to have a freemium model so there'll always be an open free version that everybody can have access to and then you know the pro or enterprise well the enterprise would just be internal to a company so maybe a company says hey like i would love this tool for you know my marketing team or my comms team to internally be able to collaborate with each other and then to be able to use open access as a distribution channel for any content because you guys have a great audience that's that's one way. And that still, you know, promotes transparency because right now, whenever companies publish reports, it's a PDF that nobody reads. So now we can get them to say, Hey, put all your data and charts on open access. I think that's a pretty good win. But secondly, yeah, the open source platform will always be there. Always, always be public, always be free for anybody to kind of collaborate with it. But that's the way we're looking at it now. We never know how things change. As you know, in startups, we, we sort of pivot, but the idea is be that home of data for everybody, but then also be a useful tool for anybody in the enterprise that wants to use it internally. Yeah. Yeah. I think having you know, 10Ks, et cetera, more accessible so people can go look. I mean, even what's happening with Credit Suisse right now, like if you were able to go look at credit default swap data, go look at actual like liquidity metrics for them in a really tangible way that doesn't require, you know, a Bloomberg terminal and add more data storytelling behind that. I think that'd be a huge use case to, to working against spreading misinformation about that. So that, that makes a whole lot of sense. How would you know that open access has been like completely successful? What's the next big item for you all moving forward? Yeah, great question. KP. APIs. My investors yeah. ask me a lot about this too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so right now, because we're in beta, we're trying to understand who is our core user, you know, who is that persona that we want, that the hundred people that kind of love us, and then how do we kind of grow from there? So the first uh, sort of what we're looking at is how many people come to the platform, and then how many people sign up, and then we have to split the creators from the consumers. Mm -hmm. So we inadvertently became this this platform that has what's called the like the cold start problem, which mm -hmm. you've seen probably in Reddit or even LinkedIn or, or Tinder where you're like, you have to have X amount of people or content on the platform for people to want to use it. So people will come and be like, oh, I want to create a chart, but I don't find any data. So I'm not going to create anything, you know? Um, so we have to get the data first before they can create something. We're trying to separate the creators versus the consumers. Right now, like we have, like I said, 20,000 monthly active users. That's pretty awesome. But majority of them are like consuming. They're kind of like Reddit lurkers or checking it out. So the goal now is to focus just on the creators, get them on board, which in any community is only like probably 5%, right? Give them those tools to push pump out the content and then we can get those consumers in afterwards. So converting those 20,000 into, you know, users who want to either create charts or share them. And, you know, that creates kind of, you know, feedback loops and user-generated content and network effects, which drives more signups. And then from there, we can, you know, look at a monetization strategy, customization, very similar to GitHub, right? You know, private, private version. Then you can look into enterprise uh, for, you know, privacy and, and all that stuff and permissions and data integrations. But right now it's like how many people show up, how many people are creating content and are they sharing it? Let me know if this is a bad analogy, but it sort of reminds me of like Pinterest where like yeah. you're able to go and like look at different things, like look at different data sets, look at different pens. But of course, like there's so much more to it than just that. But I think that that sort of like usability and that um, explore functionality is, is super powerful for having people just get more comfortable around data. Yeah, absolutely. We, we've heard the Pinterest for data Have before you? and Tumblr okay. for data. So uh, we're okay. definitely embracing those. Nice. And uh, and to your kind of point you alluded to, yeah, it's, I don't think it's enough to just be a publisher of data. Like there's some great out, stuff out there. Government's pretty good at it, even though it's a bit messy. You know, our world and data is out there, which is great. We want to give people the tools and the ability to actually collaborate themselves, right? And upload their own data sets or their own analysis. And that I think is missing in the world of sort of data storytelling and collaboration. Yeah, I mean, I think with our world and data, you know, they had that plastic bag thing that was actually like, accidentally misinformation. So if you had more people sort of building on the back end and being like, oh no, actually this is what the data means, you know, that that, that probably wouldn't have happened as much. So it makes total sense. And so this will be my final question for you, but like what has been your your favorite data set to peruse right now? Oh yeah. Good question. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time looking at at Fred, but I would okay, I would say two things. One, the actual data set is is one on uh, the someone uh, Erica Chenoweth is an academic I think at Harvard did a study where she tried to look at different civil wars or mass resistance campaigns over time and see whether or not the violent or nonviolent had more um, of a success rate. And she kind of debunked the, the idea that you have to be violent to sort of have a successful mass unrest campaign. And that requires a lot of research. You know, it gets very granular. You have to kind of go on the ground. And that type of data, I think, is, is fascinating. It's, it's hard to come by, but it's also something that you can, you know, create, hopefully change perception of people, but also policymakers and government. People cross the social contract of government, private, 
private sector and civil society. Any data set that has an impact of that, I, I love it. So I thought that was a really cool one that she did. But generally speaking, I mean, you know, time series are pretty powerful. You don't have to have anything other than a line chart to really tell a story. So I'm always fascinated by that. And I'm also trying to bring on, obviously, we want economic indicators on the platform. And that's super important because it tells us sort of the health of the economy, quote unquote. But something we realized during the, during the campaign was like, maybe we should look at more indicators. You know, what about like, you know, clean air, clean water, or other, other intangibles that we don't really measure that often. So I'm always fascinated to see if anybody can measure any other non-traditional indicators of sort of well-being and and mm-hmm. uh, and health. So that's something that I want to explore a little bit more of. I'll include all the information below, but is there a best place for people to reach you or to get more information on open access? Yeah, um, you can DM me on Twitter. <laughs> it's my name, Alex underscore Damianu, or you can go to openaccess.com, A-X-I-S, uh, sign up for the beta. You can email me, alex at openaccess.com. You can send me a carrier pigeon to Brooklyn. <laughs> I'm pretty accessible. We just want to have great people checking out the beta and asking questions like, let us know what you want to see. You know, What problem can we solve for you with data storytelling? Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. I'll include all that information below. And thanks again for all that you're doing for data. Likewise. Thanks so much, Kyla. So if you enjoyed that interview, go ahead and check out openaccess.com. Like I said, I'll also link it in the description box below. But let me know your thoughts below on data storytelling and the importance of data in our society. Thanks so much for hanging out. Thanks so much for spending time with me and I will talk to you all soon.